The indictment by the International Criminal Court, ICC, for crimes against humanity came as a surprise and shock for Francis Kirimi Mudaura. The charges emanated from the events around the disputed 2007 presidential election and the violent aftermath that led to the death of over 1,000 Kenyans. Mudaura, who was then serving as the powerful head of public service under President Mwaiki Baki's government, recalls tense moments down the ICC corridors, including fears of being locked up at the ICC detention facility in The Hague in Netherlands. In a wide-ranging interview with Citizen TV's Linus Kaikai, Mudaura opened up on the highs and lows of his many years of service in diplomacy, public service, and high-level politics. From the conversation which comes ahead of the launch of his book, A Moving Horizon, Mudaura leaves little doubt on his constant place in government, particularly during President Kibaki's reign. He was, as we title this interview, the enforcer in chief. This is part two of that interview. I remember this big press conference at the State House, a um, yes. famous picture of cabinet uh, ministers walking out with the president and mm. prime minister, vice president, uh, to the garden of, uh, of the State House there. Yes. For the cabinet to declare that we couldn't agree and we leave it to parliament to decide. Yes. Where were you that day and how I did that there. make you feel? I yes. was there. Yes. I was there. Tell us about that day. <laughs> you know, the the... You know, at that time, I told you both the PNU and the ODM, I mean, the cabinet was a combination of both, PNU and ODM. Each of them in his mind, or, or each side in, it, in their mind, they and the, the people they could be pointed at as the culprit. Now, they could not agree you know, they knew they cannot agree. So that's why they sent the matter to the parliament. And they thought parliament will make a decision after a thorough debate. And, the, you know, the, the parliamentary debate will give a clear picture of exactly what happened. Because a lot of people in parliament, of course, are from those places. And they can argue, they can explain exactly what happened. But that's not what happened in parliament. The parliament itself was divided. So everybody was saying, don't be vague. Go to the Hague. Go to the Hague. Yeah. So there was no serious, serious intellectual dialogue. And if this matter was taken to the local tribunal, I'm sure, even even the local tribunal would not would not would not have succeeded in condemning people. Do, do you do you think the president at the time, Mike Kibaki, shares in the blame of the failure of uh, those processes to deliver a local process instead of ICC? Um, well, you know what I would say is that um, he tried, but the government was weak. You know sometimes. Even the powers of the president get scaled down, especially when we are operating in a coalition system. You cannot bulldoze. Right. Mm. Because it was almost like a 50-50 cabinet. Mm. And I want to close, ask to close the ICC issue there and go to this grand coalition government, which uh, you sat in, a very unusual kind of government. Yes. That had up to 40, um, two, 44 ministers. ministers. Yes. How was it for you as the secretary to the cabinet to basically communicate with such a large uh, number? Number, yes. No, communication is not difficult, but what surprised me, that the cabinet became one of the most efficient cabinets in the history of the country. And their performance record is one of the best in the history of the country. Um, if, even when we had this uh, review of the Constitution, uh, this uh, initiative, what do you call it? BBI. BBI initiative. Yes. Yes. I made a, a proposal to flame the Kenyan government, to have a government 
organized in lines with that on that uh, BBI. And because I was saying, in the future, when you go through an election, the number one candidate should invite the number two to form a coalition. And that will encompass almost 90, over 90 percent of the, of the Kenyan population. The idea is uh, during that uh, grad coalition, every, every Kenyan felt he belongs to the government. They all felt they are part of the system. There was nobody fighting government from the side during the grad coalition. So the ministers focused on delivery of their own programs. And there was competition even within who delivers faster than the other. Eventually, you know, the, you know we are working on the basis of the, um, the strategy. The strategy which we are Mission working on. No, yeah, the strategy was a combination of the two manifestos. Mm -hmm. You know, we collapsed the two manifestos of the PNU and the ODM. We collapsed them into one and then developed a strategy document for implementation, uh, which of course was read to the vision, vision 2030. Mm. And really the implementation went on in a very harmonious way. Initially there were some incidences of uh, appointments, what not, that's what people saw. Uh, you know, so and so has been appointed and uh, so this part has not been considered. There were small incidences, but on the whole, that cabinet worked very harmoniously. And uh, it was uh, result-oriented. Result they came out with very good performance record at the end of it. Remember, the economy grew up to over 7%. Uh, which was uh, wonderful, and even most of the most of the transformational uh, programs that we have in the country today. You remember the expansion? There was a focus on education. Education was expanded, moved from free primary to free day secondary, and that did expanding education in our country very effectively. And then we expanded university education from six un public universities to 22 public universities. I think now there are more than, uh, more than, more than I think 30 of, mm. more than 50, I think, almost 40 something public universities. You know, that, that's not a small achievement. The other area which was uh, where we had a wonderful achievement is in communications. For, for a long time, Kenya was lagging behind. But at that time, when Indemo and Karega Mutai were, Mutai were the, or the, or the minister, we were able to expand um, communications in the country very effectively. Yes. And Kenya now is one of the reading. The same with the power, the same with the even roads, what we have, urban transformations like Nairobi, what not. And the, more important, the most important thing is that we're able to come with a new constitution. Yeah. Mm. You, you've hailed it as one of the best cabinets uh, in the history of the, of the country. Yet one of the issues, and that was on the representation side, quite a successful uh, experiment. Yes. But there are still murmurs about portfolio balance, you know, some ministries that are supposed to be more powerful than others, more endowed in terms of the budget than yeah. others. There, there, was, there was that contest. How, how was that navigated? You know, you know, we negotiated those um, portfolios, but there are certain things that I advised, and the government will not that advice. If you are the president. You are the chief executive of the, of the government. There are certain ministries you need to have to make sure that your authority is final. Let's say like the, 
Minister for Finance has to be with, with you, with the President, as CEO. Uh, Minister for Security and Defense, those two ministries have to be with you. The Attorney General has to be with you. That's what they advised, of to make sure that the government is run with the, the necessary stability and security. Now, don't you think the, 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 the Prime Minister? Don't you think, Ambassador, yeah. that your advice was uh, fly straight in the face of uh, consensus, which will be the spirit of a coalition? No. Because the, the President would need to speak no, to the Prime Minister. No, I'm telling both of them. Yeah. This is advice in both the President and the Prime Minister. And both of them, I advised them that way. And the Prime Minister was there. And then I said, the Prime Minister now can pick what he thinks is also critical. At least the first, the first four ministries. He took agriculture. He took, you know, he, he took um, public works and uh, he took land. He took, you know, for them to agree, you know, they, they, they argued, but me as a cabinet secretary was advising what we need to do. And they agreed. The other ministries, they just, they are more or less the same. If you, if, if you, to, if you take education, agriculture, and, uh, you know, and uh, ministries like the lands, which also with the lands and natural resources, which control a lot of nat national wealth. And they did that, and they agreed, well, both of them. Yeah. Before that, you know, that division was negotiated for, for about, um, for about, almost more than half a month or um, three weeks. Mm -hmm. It was actually fading. They could not agree, but I came with that, that formula. formula. Yes, but and but it, how, they, they accepted. Many years later, how how objective was the formula in your view, considering that uh, you are really an appointee of the president and not the prime minister, and so your allegiance is more to one n n than no, the other? Actually, the, the public service is supposed to be professional. And that is, uh, when we are serving the prime minister or the president, we are serving them, I mean, it, you give them the best advice you can get. Whether he's a prime minister, we are not a political. We try to be not political. Yet at one time, uh, you had the prime minister saying he doesn't have a toilet, he doesn't have a, a carpet, he doesn't <laughs> receive uh, the, the necessary government protocol. Let me tell you. And indeed, the accusation was getting a dotted line. When to he office. was talking that way, at one time he came to the office of the president. Because they are not, at that time we are not interacted, he came to Arambi House. Then uh, if, uh, President he was meeting and not finished. I told Prime Minister, you come to my office, let's talk a bit. This is the time I was being accused of a lot of things. I told the Prime Minister, Prime Minister, you stand up. I opened the curtain of the, of the office. I told him, do you see that building? That is the, 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 the vice, vice President's office now. I'm, I'm negotiating to buy it for you. He couldn't believe it, that I can initiate a thing like that. At that time, he was being housed. The Shell House. In, no, not Shell. Yeah, he was being housed at the, the Treasury, Treasury building, because that's where we found the, the best office. So I told him, you are in Treasury office, that's temporary. But now I want to negotiate it. I'm negotiating to buy Shell House. You know, you couldn't believe it. I'm negotiating, and uh, I think I'm seeing signs that we are, we are going to, because the president has given me an okay to go ahead and negotiate. After that, he could not doubt. He could not doubt my intention about how I want the prime minister to be, what I want him to be. Now, there came a problem of uh, competition between the, the Prime Minister and the Vice President. Now, I was, 
was asked by Mutura Kilonzo to try to define the functions. I defined them. And I said the Prime Minister is in charge of government or government business. And the Vice President is in charge of the state matters. But in the event of death of the President, the Vice President becomes a President. And you put this in writing? I put this in writing uh, to Parliament. And the Parliament approved it unanimously. Did each understand the difference between state and government? Yeah, I was giving state functions, event, examples, so that I can understand. Did it, did it resolve the differences between completely. Ray Lauding and Kalonzo Musi? Completely. Protocol issues ended. There were issues of protocol, was not, they all ended at that point. They continued a bit on the floor of the House. In the beginning, where... but after that, Parliament finished. After the Parliament report by Mutura Clones, I think court finished. Beyond the paperwork, did you do footwork in terms of just making these two meet and maybe with the boss? Uh, no, meeting. Kibaka? You know, after that, after the cabinet was formed and what have you, they had regular meetings. They had, you know, the, the president and the prime minister, you know, as his, um, you know, a key pillar in terms of uh, working. You know, you know the other thing which people even don't rem don't don't know. Prime Minister chaired all cabinet meet all th cabinet committee which meetings is. because he thought he would not be he would be marginalised. But when we are chairing cabinet committee meetings, that's where the decisions are made, and the cabinet just is to endorse. And in most cases. President would concur with the recommendations from there. Ambassador, you're sitting right at the top of a very interesting troika of power. You have Kibaki, you have uh, Kalonzo Musyok, and you have Raila Odinga. Yes. And these are three very different personalities. Yes. Uh, uh, even in terms of how they conduct their businesses. Their, their businesses. What are your readings of each? What were your readings of each and what were those things about their personalities that helped make your job easy or even complicated your work even more? <laughs> you know, somehow, somehow, you know, all of them became my friends. You know, once they are your friends, then there is no fight. It's just to find a solution. And it worked very well. They all worked, we all worked as friends. Uh, in terms of any time I have issues raised with the Prime Minister, I would just go across or call. Any time he has an issue, he called me and what have you. And, well, the Prime Minister is, uh, I normally would tell him, uh, you know, Prime Minister, I'm not here to, to block you. I'm here to assist you to achieve the objectives that you want achieved in government. I'm a facilitator. And they realized that my work was facilitation. Maybe I'll, I'll let you respond to some of the very specific characterizations of these three leaders. And I want to start with President Kibaki, who yeah. you you was your immediate uh, 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 boss. The, yeah. the, there was this notion that he was a fence uh, very fearful of taking decisions, slow. Was that Correct. Uh, you know, people, people did not understand Kibaki. Uh, what they did not understand is that Kibaki was a very knowledgeable person. He knew the government in and out, the history of the government. He had a very strong sense of um, um, how the economy is going, or what needs to be done about the economy. So briefing, when we were briefing Kibaki, was very simple to brief him, to get the point very easy. The other thing is um, President Kibaki didn't talk too much. He listened until he get the points he wants, 
Ukifika hapo anakuambia ni hapo. Sasa endelea. He want, there is something that he wants. Once you reach there he tells you sasa that's what I want us to do. Go on. After that he wants results. And normally he will tell you I want results in the next two weeks or one week. Very sh- sh- gives you a very short time. Um, the, there was a problem which of course people um, did not did not understand. You know, after the accident, the president had remember he had an accident during the campaign. Yes. Uh, during the campaign, now he stopped uh, after that accident. He stopped talking a lot the way he used to talk in the past as a politician and what have you. Uh, he became a, <laughs> more of a, a listener and a decider. Uh, the the, the good thing is that um, Kibaki never pursued any personal agenda. He pursued national agenda. And he used the, the institutions of governance very effectively. When he called me uh, to inform me that, uh, or after he appointed me as head of public, or his permanent secretary, head of public service, now I went to his office. Just soon after the accident, he was recovering. Actually, he still under the 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 the, the, the bandage. So he asked me now. I introduced myself. Of course, we had met several times before, but you introduced yourself. Yeah, he told me I know you, and uh, I want you to, you know, really help me. In, in, we work to deliver to the people. So I asked him, Your Excellency, how many, how many cabinet meetings do you want? How, how often should we have cabinet, cabinet meetings? I asked him, a month? He told me no. Weekly. No, yeah, by weekly, every two weeks. I thought because of uh, he was recovering, Two weeks is too much, too much pressure on him. No, he said, no, I will manage. I, I will manage. Do you know he kept that up the time he retired by weekly cabinet without fail? I'm trying to tell you what type of person we were working without fail. Every two weeks cabinet. Uh, the other thing is uh, to understand Kibaki, the way he operated. He operated on basis of uh, professional and vices. But there's also feel that that cabinet was about five years late. This is the cabinet he should have had in 2002. He was with exactly the same uh, the people. Uh, same, same people. Yes. And you walk in as cabinet, uh, as secretary of cabinet, to replace Sally Kosge one afternoon. Yes. Uh, an, an, an announcement. Yes. And uh, you come into uh, a situation where there was friction within the uh, cabinet. Yes. And um, especially about that portfolio sharing, the cabinet w- was already having problems between the national, within the National Rainbow Coalition. You know, that, that, you know the, the National Rainbow Coalition, coalition became a bit uh, problematic with the initial cabinet. When it was appointed, uh, the Rairan group was not happy with the appointment. He thought that there was, it was weighted uh, in favor of the, at that time, it uh, was not PNU. It was Liberal Democratic Party. Liberal Party. Democratic yes. Party. Yes. It was, uh, it, and it was more weighted than that. On the NNK yeah. National Alliance. Now, yeah. what happened is that actually that uh, discontent grew um, even more when now it came to the constitution. You remember Kibaki had promised to give a new constitution within uh, a year or so of taking power. So they started working very hard to get the new constitution. But then at one point, there was a real disagreement where 
you, you know, like the issues of um, devolution were very controversial. Um, you know, Raira team wasn't devolution to the government would be devolved to the provinces. While Kibaki side, PNU was talking of decentralization to the districts. Why you decentralize government activity? It's the central government, but with the decentralized. Mm. So that was um, one of the one of the major arguments. The other argument which was there was uh, whether the government should be parliamentary. Parliamentary you know, is read by a prime minister, yeah. or whether it should be presidential. That was another another issue. But before now, that, before that, now, that what yeah. happened is yeah. that. What happened is that because of that division, then the government went divided. You know, we lost the referendum on the constitution, yes. 2005, because of that division. That's why the referendum or the constitution was rejected, draft constitution. Mm. I, yes. I want to take you mm. back a little bit to the beginnings, because yeah. before all those arguments, there was one argument. Yes. Uh, where, where again your name came about and maybe you can use the opportunity to address it and even as we wait to read your, your book and that is the famous MOU between, the, between Kibaki's National Alliance uh, of Kenya, NAK yes. and Raila Odinga's Liberal Democratic Party, LDP yes. an MOU that this is what was said so that you can respond <laughs> That the handlers of the new president, Mwai Kibaki, that included Francis Mudaura, yes. refused to have a second look at that MOU. <laughs> no, you know the problem is that the people accused Mudaura for things that Mudaura was outside. You know, I did not I didn't know anything about the MOU until I came into the into the cabinet. But the appointment of that cabinet, that's the time I was appointed also. I was appointed on the day that cabinet was appointed. Otherwise, before that, I was, I was outside. Now, the implementation of the, you know, of the memorandum was, was implemented during those appointments. But I was not a part of that. I was not a, a, point, a part of the initial Management. The people who are managing the appointment were people who are managing the parties at that time. This I have no way of confirming. Only you. you no, can I'm confirm. telling you the truth. Yes, yes, only you can confirm yes. the accusation that, as head of public service, yes. your first advice to the government was that the creation of a position of prime minister was a constitutional illegality. No, you know, the, of course, at that time you could not create a position of, of uh, prime minister. It, it was no, nowhere in the constitution. You had to amend the constitution in order to create a post of prime minister. That's a fact. The coalition, NAC, had a little thing called the summit. Yes. Uh, made up of the leaders from different regions. Um, and if I could just run through very quickly. Yes, there, I know. There was I know. Mike back I know the, the summit. You remember the summit? Yes. And one of the accusations was that Francis Mudaura stopped it. <laughs> you know, those are things that are completely, of course, completely out of space because when I came in, when I was appointed, the summit, I mean, the appointments had already been done. My name was among the appointees from outside. So I did not know exactly what imbalances, what imbalances they were considering at that time, because I was outside. It's a future appointment where, of course, I was facilitating the president right. to define his list and what have you. And I want us to walk to that future because we fast track now from MOU failing to 2005, there is a referendum. Yes. And uh, one afternoon, 4 p.m., if I remember it correctly, President Kibaki goes on television and fires the entire cabinet. Yes, after the... After the, the referendum results. Uh, uh, yeah, you know the... 22nd of... Mm -hmm. I will tell you that the referendum was very, very, you know, you know, for us it was very saddening because we did not expect a thing like that one to happen. 
because the economy was doing very well. You remember the economy was really growing very fast. The country was uh, doing generally very well. And we thought the referendum would, I mean, the referendum would be, the government would succeed. But uh, well, to our surprise, I didn't sleep last night. Uh, when they were counting and what have you, only to find the government had lost. I remember Kibaki was in Odaya, and I called him very early in the morning, like uh, 7 o'clock. I told him, Your Excellency, when, when are you coming? Because we have to come and accept the result. Because if you don't accept the result, there will be a lot of speculation. He told me, I'm coming right now. You prepare the, the statement, and uh, I'll issue it, accepting the result. Now, about the, the cabinet, you know, the, the cabinet, that, uh, why the cabinet was dissolved. I said, of course, the president has come, but then he needs to reason out with the key political leaders, partners in the party, in his party, who are top level, so that when, when he's making a decision, is well briefed. So I told the, I advised the Minister for Security, um, Chris Michuki. It was Michuki at that time. At the time yeah. Michuki at that time. Yeah. I told him to organize a meeting, a meeting of the, of the key part, you know, participants in the coalition and the regional leaders including the vice president, including the, you know, the leader, the regional strong people to consult, those were in government, to consult as and organize a meeting of, the, of them with the president at the 11 o'clock that morning. So I called, I told them to come, uh, to have a meeting at, uh, I advised them to have a meeting at nine so that they are all able to discuss and find the best way out. Because we're in a crisis, it's a serious crisis. ODM is calling for removal, removal of the government, fresh elections and what have. Uh, so we need to exchange ideas to see how best way. Uh, President himself was, has accepted the results, um, but uh, we need to tell the people the way forward out of this. ODM was calling for demonstrations, then go to State House and tick it up. So how do you stop it? <laughs> that movement, if people are so enthusiastic. So they, they met, and I was there. And uh, they said the best way, really, when uh, something like this has happened and the cabinet is so divided, because we have failed because the cabinet was divided. The best thing is for the president to dissolve the cabinet and reorganize it after that. And that became popular. I think that came from uh, Combo, or, you know, Combo. Muscari Combo. Muscari Combo proposed that. He was a minister of trade and industry at that time. And the people said that makes a lot of sense. Let's advise the president to dissolve the cabinet and then reconstitute it so that we, we, we reinstate the confidence, the public confidence. But the point was to get rid of those who disagreed with him, like... Of course, that, 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 that was almost uh, automatic. But it, that, I mean, that was uh, definitely what they felt, because they cannot work together the way they are. So they advised the president, and the president was uh, happy with the advice, but he said, yeah, you people, you can, go, uh, you can go and then we shall reconstitute, but then I want to be left with the uh, vice president and the attorney general, whose ones they should not be touched. But the vice president and the attorney general. 
you know, the of them can manage a government. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, nobody can see there is a vacuum or anything, or there is no consultations, important consultations. And that's what he did. Um, then I remember advising him, Your Excellency, if you say the cabinet is dissolved without giving people time limit, then there will be a vacuum. So I told him, Your Excellency, the cabinet should be dissolved for two weeks, maximum. And it, he said that makes a lot of sense, two weeks. And within two weeks, he was able to announce a new cabinet, which was a big surprise to a lot of people because of the size. The cabinet was too big, but you know when a country is divided, you have to include people, you have to bring more people to give the government strength. Right. Tell us about the process. Uh, we, we only saw him on television during the press conference. Yeah. But, but now from your uh, seat, which is that of uh, uh, Secretary of the Cabinet, yes. do you contact them separately or do they have to get this news from television? Wh which one? The, the, the dissolution of the Cabinet. Uh, no, no, that one is uh, it's very formal. The President has to make an official statement, which is if issued formally and also gazetted. Yeah. Are the cabinet minister, were they informed beforehand or they only they knew saw it? After, after that, in the time, press conference, they knew of what that was happening. Because we, you, that team and it, its own uh, members, because it's, we are talking about the leaders of political parties, yeah. so they had to inform their people. Yeah. How's the atmosphere going forward from uh, 05 to 2007? Because there are these arguments that uh, 05 really planted the seeds of the 2007 post-election violence. Oh, well, the, indefinitely that division, you remember the ministers who campaigned against the government, I think it was six, they were left out. And uh, instead of them trying to, to make defenses, they decided to fight it on. So they continued, that the campaign started immediately after the new cabinet. You remember there are some people even who were nominated for the cabinet, I mean, who were appointed for the cabinet, but they rejected, they refused, yes. because they belonged to the other side. And uh, so the, the campaign started at that time. So the tensions, why did they, you know, exploded into the post-election battle? Yeah. Uh, maybe we could talk about, uh, you, you've, you've very well exhausted the uh, topic of Mwai Kibaki and working, working with him. Mm -hmm. uh, Raila Odinga and then uh, Kalonzo Musyoka. Yes. Raila Odinga seen as impulsive, uh, unpredictable. Is that what you found as well? Well, you know, I... You know, there, there are certain things that uh, he has been very consistent with, and uh, you know the you know the, the 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 fight for democracy, you know, for the old, from the old days of Moi, you know, fight for multi-party, what and not. I think Raider has been very consistent with that, and then devolution. He was very consistent within devolution. Uh, the other thing that um, I think he has been, uh, uh, you know, uh, he, he has been very, very consistent with is, um, you know, is call it uh, independence of, of you know, you know, parties and party politics, development of party, party politics. I think that he has made a lot of contribution in that in the country. And even the, the constitution, you know, the evolution, although did not take the ship he wanted completely, the compromise that, that came in, that in the evolution, was um, to devolve to the counties. And the counties, as defined, uh, I think, in by, by, an, uh, by a gazette of 1991 or something. 
Because what was found is that um, what people are afraid of in terms of devolution is to devolve to the provinces. You devolve even some security agencies. And then provinces become, th those, those uh, devolved units become very powerful uh, to the extent that they can threaten even the national government. You see, like, Ethiopia has a lot of problems. Because Ethiopia was one of the examples that we used to have a lot of problems with some of the they are, they are, they are devolved units. Uh, so we wanted a devolved government that would not challenge the national unity, national cohesion. Um, and it came to compromise, which was very good. Uh, when it came now to the presidential system of government, Raida compromised, but uh, with uh, with sub, some reservations, reservations. Yes. reservations. Because the whole issue was, um, you remember there was an Ivasha meeting of members of leaders, members of parliament, to resolve the outstanding issues in the, in the constitution. So president decided to have a meeting at, at the Arambi house with all the key leaders, you know, with the prime minister, with the, and the key ministers, like at that time, Ruto was there, Vice President Calonzo, uh, the Attorney General, the House Minister of Security, and the Vice President uh, George Saitoti. Really to discuss on how they can resolve. You remember the outstanding issues. That was the presidential or, and the devolution. And the number of and countries. The water, you know. and structure of countries. That's the same when decisions were made in that yeah. meeting. Yeah. That meeting consultation in Arambi made the decisions or now the devolution should go from the provincial to, to the 47 we have today. And uh, that was uh, uh, accepted. We take a short break. We'll be back with Ambassador Francis Kirimi Mudaura. Mm -hmm.